Perfect. Okay, so welcome everyone to episode uh, 66. Um, and thank you to uh, Michael Nitsche, who we will be calling Nitta from now on, um, for joining us. And uh, for those of you who don't know, he's a very experienced sports podiatrist, an insane runner himself. Uh, I keep telling myself I'm going to delete you off my Strava because looking at your numbers is no good for my own ego. But um, yeah, the boy can run. He knows his way around a running track and around running shoes. So we, we, we actually, the three of us have a little, a little group where we just talk about this kind of stuff uh, and have done for the last several months. And we just thought, well, we might as well get in front of a camera and do it, particularly as um, it, there's a new shoe that's uh, coming out. It's, I don't know, who, you'll have to tell me when it's coming out in Australia, but it's out uh, in the next couple of days in London. When's it coming out in Oz? It's supposed to be the 30th. Yeah, about, 30th, about the start so of February. Yeah, a week. So yeah. um, I've actually got one here. It's the Nike <laughs> Infinity React. Just, yeah, I, did I mention that Nike gave me one, Little, and you haven't got one yet? <laughs> you, you have got the New Balance. Um, you've got the fuel cell, though, haven't you? The fuel cell I've racer. I've got the fuel cell racer, yeah. yeah. Actually, I was disappointed to find out that I've got the fuel cell racer, and apparently all the elites have a fuel cell racer with a modified outsole, so it's about 20 grams lighter. So I don't even feel that special anymore. <laughs> well, you've still got one and I haven't. So I, but anyway, we're going to come on to talk about this shoe. And this is why we've called the episode to infinity and beyond open brackets, injury, close brackets, because there's some claims uh, or some, some marketing around this shoe that we definitely want to tease out. And we're going to, we're going to come back to that. Um, yeah, Craig's got it up here. Um, the shoe that, you know, the, the golden, uh, what, what would we call it? The, uh, the holy grail, perhaps we would call it, wouldn't it? We, the shoe that can... Um, that can influence positively influence injury rates if that's indeed what it does. So we're going to talk about that. Um, before we do, let's just be a bit more, before we, it's not, not really a Nike episode per se, but let's just be a bit more um, vague about kind of the, the topic itself, not vague, but sort of broad, I should say, sorry. Um, okay. And let's talk about the proposed relationship between, between injury and shoes. And I think relationship is the right word because we've all seen runners who have that, uh, post hoc reasoning where uh, they, they've developed an injury and they blame the shoe. Uh, and there's very much beliefs out there from runners. And, and I think some clinicians probably have beliefs that, that shoes have the ability to, to cause injuries. And if that is true, I mean, get your take on whether you think it is Nissa in a minute, but if it is, then it, it stands to reason they could have the ability to, um, dare we use the word prevent injury? I don't know if prevent's too strong a word, or at least if they can negatively influence injury rates, they can positively influence them with their design features. So could we get your take as, as a runner yourself, as someone who's had almost every shoe under the sun, as a podiatrist, as someone who's knows, knows this research inside out, where, where are we at with this shoe injury relationship right now? I, I think it's the reason why I probably got into podiatry because I, you always want something really simple to explain why things aren't going right. And something like a footwear, you know, footwear modification, footwear change, to cause injury, for example, sounds, you know, it's human nature to not want to, you know, tell everyone that I did the wrong thing, I overtrained or I underrested. Um, it's very hard to admit that um, as a runner. And unfortunately, the evidence leans towards, you know, um, that getting that balance between stress and rest wrong is incorrect. And, and shoes may have a large influence on that. I wasn't around in the 1950s and 60s and 70s when midsoles came out and the shoes evolved. But definitely when you look at um, the retrospective, development of, of running footwear in the late 80s you started seeing a lot more technology go into shoes and with this technology came performance but also came be able to run more miles and maybe maybe reduce injury risk and that's i guess created almost a perception now in 2020 that shoes have the ability to be able to influence injury risk and i think probably for the past two to three decades maybe longer um, you see this ebbs and flows of people looking at footwear and their influence of injury without anything distinct. Um, so we just don't know, um, we know shoes can influence um, some of the loading rates. We can know shoes can influence uh, your performance to some extent, but there's no uh, panacea of footwear that seems to be able to protect everyone from making training areas. You can make as many training areas as you want and footwear will be there by your side to make sure you still keep running. So we aren't quite there yet. And uh, it's been a while, probably maybe five or six years since I've seen looking at studies of preventing injury, maybe even a decade, if you look at the vibrant cases back a decade ago, and to see um, us in the past three to five years focusing on footwear and performance, which I, you know, things like the Vaporfly have been really exciting for footwear development. And it's, I would say the last 20, 20 years of being involved in running, it's been the most enjoyable part of footwear in my, since I've been a podiatrist, that's for sure. 
And now we're back to injury and um, trying to solve that puzzle, which arguably hasn't hasn't been solved yet. So Nike are trying to attempt to um, to to create a perception or use the perception that shoes can cause injury to maybe um, um, tap into that market. Yeah, and and it's still a massive market. I was I was saying just before we came live, I was on one of the Facebook groups, the running Facebook groups that I lurk on, just just so I can get that kind of. Um, get into the runner's head so to speak and 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 there was a post just just two two days ago if that two, you know one two days ago of a, of a guy said coming on asking for advice on the internet always a bit of a, a red flag that in itself mm-hmm. but coming onto the internet to ask strangers for advice and he had an injury mm-hmm. and he'd done some kind of reading around and he was absolutely certain. I, I, I've realised it's the shoes. He, he, there was there was no 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 sort of uh, entertaining that it may have been his poor sleep patterns or his high stress mm. levels or his or his nutrition or his load management yeah. or you know tra- training errors. We know. You know. Um, is it is it just because people want the easy answer? Is it because buy buy X and I'll be okay? Or it, you know we can just lace up our shoes and walk out the door and that's inevitably going to be so much more easy than trying to bank eight hours sleep or, you know, keeping a spreadsheet about acute to chronic work, acute to chronic workload ratio or whatever way we, we manage our load. Is it just ease or, or is it, is it more of a societal belief that we have to really unpick because it's been there for so long? Yeah, it's, it's a, tr- it's a good question. Like whether it's behavioral, whether it's in, in, in intuitive i'm not sure like there was a sarah goto study in 2014 that tried to tease out what people's perceptions were of what caused running related injury and and um you know footwear choice was right up there um as one of the bigger the bigger perceptual causes of footwear of, of running related injury and i mean you know i i've this my, i've had a a a small stress reaction in my sacrum maybe six weeks ago and the first thing i would deviate towards is um is you know what things can i easily fix to be able to reduce my risk of this happening again whereas it was a simple case i was probably just collecting too much running and not resting quite as much at that point in time but it is it seems to be human nature to try and find an easy answer and um whether or not that's been influenced a little bit by perhaps maybe uh, marketing, like running's a pretty simple sport. You go out the door and the only tool you need is running shoes. So of course it always gets targeted, doesn't it? So um, well, there are other sports. So I'm not sure if you know tennis rackets have an association with increased tennis elbow compared to other tennis rackets. I'm not really sure, but when it comes to to running footwear, it's an easy it's an easy thing to blame. And you'd almost make the argument that perhaps I don't know if it's changed over the past. Um, 30, 40 years. Um, I don't know if back in the 1950s if people were blaming their flat-soled shoes um, as, you know, it caused a running-related injury because they maybe weren't that different from, you know, wearing no shoes at all. So maybe they didn't get the blame. But because there's a price tag attached to them, um, you know, a price tag is attached to maybe this $200 shoe can protect me from injury. And it's that word protect, I think, that people really maybe want to, you know, pay a few extra dollars for perhaps. Yeah. And these are the words, aren't they? Protect me from injury. Or pre- can, what? What will prevent injury? Which is such a, mm. it's such a, it's such a bold word. And I, I'm, I'm so, I'm so uh, clear with runners in clinic that that you know, you're a runner. The risk of injury is greater than zero. That's the, mm-hmm. the phrase I always say. Like, can we mitigate that risk? Well, there's, there's the debate, isn't it? But and the shoes part of that discussion. Yeah. But do you do you think it's the biggest part? Of the, it's the biggest part of the discussion that they have with us because we're the podiatrist. But um, are they going off? Do you, you know, do you think in an ideal world they'd have the chat with the footwear about us? They'd go off to the nutritionist and talk about mm-hmm. that. They'd go off uh, to the you know the the sleep center and talk about that. They you know they talk to the yeah. psychologists about stress. They they're not doing any of those other things, are they? They're no, just that's talking right. about the footwear. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I guess in the writing schemes it's good for podiatry because they probably are dwelling on the running as such as well, where they probably could be speaking <laughs> yeah. to the um, the dietitian and spending their money elsewhere and getting advice of. You know, even from a running coach who could probably, you know, reorganize their training a bit more appropriately, et cetera. But, um, you know, maybe that's a bit too hard. Maybe that's uh, perceptually not accepted as a major cause of injury, perhaps. You know, people probably want to have the freedom to be able to do what they want. And, and I think maybe dealing with all, I mean, I get to deal with a, a lot of runners who are very um, disciplined. And I think that tends to be um, what tends to keep people injury free in the end. They tend to make good decisions and they tend to be able to organize their training well. and you know, remove load when they need to and work hard when they need to. And, and the shoe ends up just being a byproduct of that organization. You know, they'll wear a light shoe when they run fast and they'll wear a bit more shoe when they run slow. And suddenly this um, intuitive selection of footwear ends up just being part of a, a well-organized protocol. Whereas perhaps people are even, 
organize their trading around their shoe, for example. And, um, you know, you'll pick a shoe like a, maybe a Nike. I don't know what the, the new Infinity is. So like I've got the React, which is, I've got that here. This is pre, um, this was the shoe pre. And I actually just disappointed. I've heard the shoes disappearing now that the uh, Infinity is being released. Mm -hmm. I've heard they're discontinued as well. Yeah, we need to grab yeah. several yeah. pairs because that's a lovely, that's a great shoe. It's a beautiful um, shoe. I've got 1200 Ks yeah. out of this shoe the first time. It obviously has a traditional exposed foam. And it looks like it wears out within one run, but then 1200 Ks later, you're like, it looks the same. So, um, and the shoes, I guess, like the React Foam, it's a, it's a TPU based product. It feels a bit different to traditional EVA. It feels quite fun to run in. You can run slow in it, you can run fast in it. There's not much weight to the shoe. And suddenly you've got this sort of non-offensive shoe that tends to feel really comfortable. So, um, but of course, you know, bringing it back to comfort, there might be, um, part of the reason why these shoes might have an effect. So, yeah, it's interesting. Actually, we say, you know, you talking about you know good runners. Generally, when you look at their habits, that they, they've got good habits. And are, are they good runners because they got good habits, or do they have good habits because they're good runners? But when you talk to, you know, when when people are first being told about load management and whether it be the ten percent rule in, you know, mm -hmm. historically or the or any kind of using training peaks or some kind of other mm -hmm. various ratio when you talk to good runners like yourself and like people at clubs even though they've never heard of any of these terms when you look at their training they're like well yeah we've always done that and when okay. you well, you know when we first got the research that said we should probably have more than one pet we shouldn't just buy an asics kayano wear it mm -hmm. for 700 kilometers and then buy another one we should probably have multiple you know power, shoes being used in parallel and you speak That's to right. good runners and, and they're like Good runners have always been doing that. And, That's you know, right. Whatever good runners have traditionally been doing, the research is finally kind of saying this is probably what you should do. And they're all going, well, obviously. Um, so, you know, let's, let's come on to the research because we know research isn't perfect, but it is showing it, it, some of the things that it is showing are the things that good runners seem to be doing. Mm. So first question, I don't know whether it's an answerable one. Do you think the, the, the running shoe research is targeting the, the sub elite runners because actually the, do the elite do, the, do elite runners need running research is it going to change what they do yeah it's always tough like, i don't think you can really research elite runners without sort of intervening with their training protocols a lot of the time and of course if you're you know no elite runner who's got things worked out because obviously they're elite is going to stop what they're doing and, and start an intervention are they so and say oh sorry you have to do my training protocol so um, whereas I think maybe recreational runners, um, the interest is there because that's the consumer of footwear for sure. I mean, that's where the big money is. I mean, most of the runners I deal with like to try and chase up some sponsorships to get some free shoes. Um, so they're not big for the market. They want stuff for free a lot of the time. Whereas, um, and there's not a lot of money, there's not a lot of money in running. So if you're a really, really good runner in New York marathon, you can make some money out of it. But you know, if you can't break 201 or take 204 for the marathon, you're probably in strife. So trying to make a living out of it. Um, However, th there is enough research out there looking at novice runners and recreational runners. Like, um, I know before the show started, we touched on, the, oh, you mentioned the Malio study as well. And he found, like, looking at, you know, risk factors and protective factors and found that if you're rotating between parallel shoes, um, you could reduce injury incidents um, or injury risk by about 39 or 40% off memory. And that was back in 2014. And uh, Erasmus Nielsen's study looked at, um, like, 900 runners prospectively over a year. And he basically grouped them into, um, he put all these novice runners, so less than six months of experience, placed them into neutral shoes um, by definition of FPI, so foot posture index, and wanted to see if these neutral shoes, um, or the foot posture had an influence on injury risk. And um, no, there was no difference um, over a year of running. And uh, they essentially, it, it, was the foot, it was the pronated foot posture that was somewhat more protected from injury within the novice cohort um, with, no, with uh, neutral shoes. And so this begs the question, you know, a lot of the design features that are built to support foot posture may not be as relevant as we think. And it may actually change for um, how experienced you are as well. So novice runners, maybe they should be thinking about just getting their organization correct. But maybe an experienced runner, well, maybe their organization's pretty correct. And at that point in time, they're probably sleeping pretty well, eating pretty well. And so you're trying to search for like, you know, tools and um, concepts that can give you increased dosage of running to get better at running. And it's probably at that point in time where you start to use different shoes to be able to handle different dosages of running relative to the individual's running attributes, uh, physiological attributes, and probably mechanical attributes as well. Yeah, just actually, Michael, just on that point, and, and I, I know I've been hammering on about this for years myself, is that having more than one or two shoes in your rotation 
is somewhat protective. Well, surely that answers the question about can running shoes prevent injury? Well, that's right. Well, technically, if you are rotating between shoes, that, that gives you a concept that maybe you can handle more running dosage. Of, like, this yeah. is probably the biggest concept. I think as soon as you put you rotate shoes, maybe you can handle a bit more running. But of course, what, human, what runners do is that if they can handle more running, they'll just go and do more running. They do and, more um, and get hurt, yeah. <laughs> You can still exceed the you can still exceed the, uh, the, the the top threshold. Or speaking as someone who has over forty pairs of running shoes, and I currently sit here with um, I currently sit here with an injury myself. I'm 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 questioning whether multiple pairs of shoes reduce running injury risk because uh, it doesn't seem to have worked for me. But I've still gone over my threshold. It seems. Um, I'm glad you touched on the research there. You talked about the Malisu study. You talked about the Nielsen study. A couple of other uh, key studies in the in the running shoe slash injury uh, sphere mm. i just wanted to bring up just did a, did a bit of digging and i'm sure most people listening are probably aware of these two studies but let's talk a little bit about comfort we'll come back to pronation control and and assigning shoes based on foot shape or posture mm-hmm. in a second but let's talk a bit about comfort because we know this has had some airtime and and i don't know what it's like in oz at the moment but we still find that people who have accepted abandoning the whole pronation control paradigm because it's not Mm -hmm. been shown to be particularly valid or reliable. They seem to have adopted the, as long as it's comfortable, running something that's comfortable, as long as it's comfortable, Mm. you're good. Which is kind of interesting to me because I still don't think we have really good empirical data to support that. And just want to talk about the two, the two, two things. First is obviously Ben O'Neill and his team's um, theory. Uh, let's call it a theory because it is essentially just a theory, which has been around for many, many years. But they, it popped up in the BJSM, <coughs> excuse me, just just a year or two ago, which was their 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 sort of, I guess, their way of getting their comfort filter paradigm out to the masses by BJSM, T- talking about essentially comfort being king. You know, if it's not comfortable, you're at greater risk of injury. And when you dive back as far as um, the Robbins Gal hypothesis, all the way back to the early, I think it was late eighties, early nineties. Um, I think their paper, correct me if I'm wrong, was called something like unsafe due to perceptual illusion. I'm I'm going from memory. But ultimately, Mm -hmm. they said because shoes are so comfortable and so cushioned and Mm -hmm. so, you know, they just feel so lovely and protect you feel so protected. You just smash into the ground with reckless abandon. And they suggested almost you could almost read that as the more comfortable a shoe, the more injured you'll become. Mm-hmm. Which it's really interesting that maybe 30 years apart that these or the dates on these papers 30 years apart we've actually got comfort causing injury and comfort yeah. being preventing injury. Um, what's your take on this as someone who you know has worn a lot of shoes as a runner and as someone who's fully aware of all the research I'm talking about? Mm. It's 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 a good point and I think I remember I had this discussion about comfort itself like comfort's really built on what's available at the time and I'm assuming a comfortable shoe in 1970 wasn't the same as a comfortable shoe <laughs> in 2020 and so what you have available to the market actually tends to influence what you perceive as comfortable I reckon I briefed with you at the start that like if I put on like some of the new Nike four percent and even some of the new high stack shoes that um, ASICs have a good one now called the glide ride that I use for a lot of my volume and you just don't feel your calves when you run in them. I've had a history of calf injuries and Achilles injuries, but you put these things on and you wake up the next day and you can run again. Unfortunately, you can probably run again. That's, that's probably the issue. Um, <laughs> or you can, you can run a bit harder. But, and so that's really comfortable for me to wear those shoes. And uh, I, I, think, I think it's important to note that if someone, like, if someone runs more, they're at more absolute risk of injury. And, um, and that's... that's if you're exposing yourself to more running, you're at higher risk. But when you start to look at um, injury risk between, say, experienced runners and inexperienced runners, if you extrapolate their injury risk over, say, a 1,000 hours of running, it looks like those recreational runners or novice runners are at higher risk of injury compared to those who are a bit more experienced. And I, I still am of the belief that over the past two decades or so, like my own comfort filter paradigm has evolved. And um Wearing a traditional racing flat, like um, we have these debates at the moment about, you know, what, like, this is a traditional racing flat. It's got a really low stack shoe, um, a nice knitted upper, and weighs about 200 grams. And that was my regular shoe for racing. And um, I haven't worn one of them for racing for around about maybe three years now, I think, um, simply because we have the options of, you know, thicker midsoles, et cetera. And I really, for me, it, whether it's a relationship between feeling better physically, I'm not quite sure. But I go back to this shoe. And it doesn't feel as good as what it did four years ago because I haven't exposed myself to running there either. 
So whether it's the exposure time to a particular shoe, there might be an alerting effect to wearing a different shoe. And of course, we know that these, these vapor flies and the, the nice high performance shoes have a, a relationship to improving performance. But you know, if you expose yourself to running in a low profile shoe relatively often, you probably get better at it as well. I mean, you go back to Derek Clayton running 208 in a pair of you know, flats on Itsuku Tigers, for example, we well, didn't know any different. And maybe um, you know, that just became perceptually comfortable for him back then. And maybe in 2020, he puts a pair of vapor flies on and needs a bit of time to get to get used to them as well. I, I remember seeing a, a brief, I can, I can, one of the, um, the, the, the prevalent um, distance runners here, he went to Dollar for the marathon and he owns a running shoe shop in Ballarat, uh, Julian Spence. And uh, he lives in a place called Ballarat where there's a great runner called Steve Monaghetti. And everyone might know Steve. And Steve was very uh, famous for wearing those nice low profile, you know, Nike Zoom marathoners. And, and I reckon uh, they must have had a, had a conversation. He really liked the low profile flats. They felt more comfortable. And I think maybe it was about two years later, I saw him wearing a pair of the Vaporfly, um, like he's about over 50, 55 maybe at the moment, um, at the Gold Coast 10K. And obviously running pretty well in it as well. So I'll be interested to see someone who's been through the generations of running to see how comfort has been influenced by footwear design as well, because that's a, that's a changing market um, every decade. And so comfort changes every decade as well. So if a shoe is really comfortable and exposed to you to allows you to run more, well, then you're at more risk. So um, technically comfort may be a risk factor because you run more in the shoe. Um, if you can discipline yourself and not run as much in the shoe, maybe maybe um, comfort can be protective. So I don't know. So she, Once uh, again, it probably, probably comes back to, ha to what you're doing, how your, beha your own behaviours, your own hmm. error tr training or management of load rather than hmm. comfort being one thing or the other. I'm, I still don't think we've got the data to say, comfort you know run, running something comfortable and you'll be okay it's kind of interesting yeah the more comfortable you are the more you probably run sorry craig go on yeah mm. well just uh, as michael knows i'll just share this the, the, this is the shoe that i was running <laughs> in running in in the late 70s early 80s at 480 grams and yeah, i, is that I what you're... but i recall having no problems at all running in those they were comfortable mm. um a lot of people were using them but surprising they're actually still on the market so a couple of years ago i actually brought a pair I can't even walk 50 meters in them now. <laughs> yeah, you know, like it's just the, the, the back then they were fine, you know. Um, mm. But actually, let me just share this one as well. But this is the other shoe I ran in at the time. And, and these were comfortable, you know. I, I honestly. Yeah, yep. Yeah. But they were so wide in the heel. I used to get grazes in my calf muscle from the other leg, you know, mm. <laughs> from during the swing phase. But that that's, I don't recall you ever having any problems with those at the mm. time. <laughs> now. I mean, you are, you are bone on bone in your knee right now. So well, maybe, that's a bit uh, of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sorry, that's um, mean. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have brought that up. No, um, that's okay. Another issue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we've kind of, I, hope, I feel like we've, we've done the comfort thing. Let's go back to the foot mm. posture thing because it's still the prevalent model in the running magazines in the running fora online and in the running shops and and i kind of get it because they have to have some kind of template to work to and yeah. and you know they, they 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 don't know what else to work to right now but the sort mm -hmm. of classic here we are let's let's categorize the entire population into mm -hmm. one of three pigeonholes you know based on your wet footprint or your your yeah. foot posture you know but high low normal or, or pronated mm -hmm. supernated neutral whatever we want to call them and therefore, you can go into to one of these shoes. The two mm -hmm. studies that jump jump out here that sort of, um, of course, there have been many. The first one was the NAPIC uh, mm -hmm. sort of work. They did three studies in three different yep. military populations, I'm sure you know. And then they did a fourth one, which felt a bit cheeky to me, where they mm -hmm. systematically reviewed their first three. That felt like just getting a fourth publication for yeah. what you'd already done. But, but anyway, <laughs> um, what they essentially did for anyone who's uh, listening, who's not fully aware of, briefly summarise is military recruits so in theory nice and matched for age and probably activity and over their basic training of 16 weeks or whatever it may be they before they commenced they sort of randomised them to one of two groups the first group got their shoes based on their foot posture as the traditional model and the second group mm -hmm. I believe um, if memory serves they were just all given a stability shoe uh, regardless of foot posture is that, is that yep. right I'm like, I think it was a stability and then mm -hmm. at the end of that they, they look at the injury rates between the two groups and there were no difference and what I found interesting with that was that people said that shows that the old model of, of matching feet to shoes doesn't reduce injury mm -hmm. and no one ever no one ever looked at that study and said the opposite which is if we give stability shoes indiscriminately 
it doesn't increase injury risk, mm. which is exactly the same kind of discussion finding. But I yeah. think that was kind of interesting. But that I seem to remember someone. It was probably you, Craig, referring to that as the death of the wet foot test. Does that sound familiar? Oh, he's on mute. I can't yeah. hear you. Sorry, the dog was barking, so I put it on mute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was, it, was, it, was it you that yeah. called yeah. it the death of the wet oh, foot me, test? Me and others have said things like that. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. Um, um, and I think most people kind of are on board with that. But again, what, what do we do if, if we're not doing that in retail other than just, and some people have jumped onto the comfort mm-hmm. bandwagon. But then we've got Lauren Malisu's RCT that came out, mm. was it 2016 in, uh, I think it was the BJSM. And he actually showed that people with pronated feet, when they were put into stability shoes, actually had a reduced injury risk, which is kind of the, the study that, that we're all, uh, you know, all hoping came out, kind of what we assume NAPIC would show. So where, yeah. are we, where, where are we at with this? We, you know, with the murky waters of it, does foot posture or foot dynamics predict, you know, do they even correlate with injury? Do they go well with shoes? Like, where's our head at with this right now? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good, it's a real, I'm glad you brought that up as well. Like going through that Malios study that um, looked at, um, you know, stability shoes being perhaps potentially a, a protective factor for those with a pronated foot posture. They were recreational runners that were, had some experience behind them as well. But the issue is with injury is sometimes the definition itself of injury is what skews it. And uh, even some, I remember that study had a definition of one day off of injury. And you think of how many patients um, who would, you know, put a new pair of shoes on and accidentally go for a fast run, wake up with calf doms and then miss a day of running. And then suddenly by definition of that study, they've got an injury, but they haven't. Like they probably, you know, at this point in time, if you have less experience, maybe you perceive a bit of pain to be more of an injury. Whereas if you have experience and you've had Achilles tendinopathy for the last two years, you just get on with it because you've had it for two years. Um, I think maybe the definition sometimes skews it. And so that study made it, made it a bit difficult to work out if, if that was actually what was happening or not, because missing one day might not be the best way to assess injury itself. Um, so I, I feel a bit for retailers because they are a business and they have to sell shoes as well. And it's not like the retailers who um, do a gait analysis and do a foot posture assessment. They're not there trying to injure someone. They're still trying to help the person buy a pair of shoes, but that's the process that's been put in play for the past couple of decades because it's, um, it's serviceable. Um, I guess it's a good customer experience. You know, imagine going into a retail shop and filling out a survey of like, you know, um, a comfort filter, you know, you have to tick the boxes and then suddenly it localizes you down to like the shoes and the leftover. Well, these, according to your comfort filter, this is your, you know, more likely going to be your um, experience in your shoe. But what it comes down to it is that when you put a foot on, a uh, shoe on your foot and you go for a run, you react a bit differently to it. And one you might enjoy and one you might not enjoy. Like I like the feel of the noise. Oh, sorry, I like the feel of a, a shoe that's quite quiet, for example. Like I hate an audible shoe. And I have no idea why. Like I think when I was young, I had a small tib- like your tibial s- stress type injury and my right leg was making a louder noise. And now I perceive that to be a problem. So now I put a picture shoe that's light, <laughs> for example. So everyone has their own bias when they pick a shoe and, Sometimes that can be influenced by marketing. You know, that, that traditional patient that walks through the door and says, um, I always wear Asics gel. Uh, they don't know which gel, but they say, you know, I wear the Asics gel. And, and so they'll just have to sort of gravitate towards that because of their experience, which may have been positive. And that's why they pick that shoe, which makes it easier for retailers. But when someone comes in with no knowledge whatsoever, what do you do with that person? Well, it sounds like, you, it feels like you need to, start with experience from the runner first and then try and work out, okay, what if you had success in what type of running are you doing? And then the retailer works sort of backwards from there and says, well, let's try and localize down a shoe. I mean, there are some other studies that sort of nudge towards different ideas of footwear design and prescription. Like I know when Joel Fuller looked at um, minimal shoes and traditional shoes and found um, people with sort of higher body mass who wore like a minimalistic type shoe, they were higher risk of injury. Um, and maybe things like body mass may predict how much midsole goes beneath your foot and how compliant the midsole is. And suddenly we should be looking at these types of um, attributes of the shoe rather than say a supportive shoe. Um, and the question is, what is a supportive shoe? Like there's a, uh, a really a great running podiatrist in New South Wales, Tom DeCanto. He's, a, he's actually an elite runner. Like he's a very recreational in nature compared to Tom. But we talk about maybe even just the contact area of the base of the shoe. You know, some shoes have like a, you know, um, a really narrow contact space as well. There's a lot of room for error. You need to hit that relatively cleanly or fast. And, and sometimes you'll find a shoe 
I would almost argue that maybe the contact area is a little bit wider. So maybe the room for error is a bit more. And I know the Infinity specifically has sort of utilized that as one of their features of, of protection of injury. And maybe stability and is, is not what we originally thought it was. Maybe it's not a, a posting in the medial column of the foot. Maybe stability comes from elsewhere. Maybe it's the upper of the shoe. Maybe it's the surface area. Maybe it's how compliant or dense the foam is um, strategically on the shoe. So. Uh, a, a while ago, may have, been, may have been a few years back now, I wrote a blog. It was absolute clickbait. I was just trying to get some engagement. You know, the <laughs> classic, old, old, classic tactic. And I wrote a blog called um, All New and Uninjured Runners Should Be Given Stability Shoes. And I wrote it from the, I wrote it from the, from the, and it was intentionally, the, the title was intentionally provocative. And I was sit, sat back thinking, I'm going to get some serious income in here. And it's all good because there's no such thing as bad engagement. And when I wrote it, I actually, I actually got uh, complete crickets. No one really engaged with me at all about it, which either means they just disregarded it or they agreed with it. But the, the principle was, was me taking Drake that. the nappy. Kool-Aid, I think. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the principle was taping, taking that NAPIC study at the time and saying, look, if we put people in a stability shoe indiscriminately, they don't seem to get more injured, which, you know, the, the injury rate isn't any greater than what we're currently doing. And I was kind of writing it for, I was writing it for retailers saying, if I owned a shop and what would I do? If someone came in and they were a new runner, they didn't have any running experience, they had no previous running injury. So you t take all of those factors out of mm -hmm. the equation. I would get them in. A, I would get a load of stability shoes in front of them. I would put them in the one that they found in, uh, subjectively most comfortable, and mm -hmm. I would ins and I would give them real solid advice on the other things that they can do, such as load management, nutrition, sleep. Okay. And and I, I I sort of wrote saying if if there was a store in London that did this, they'd be at that time at least as evidence based as mm -hmm. I believed a, a retail store could be. And I sat back waiting for the shots to be fired. And I just mm. got nothing. I just got nothing yeah. back. And the, the more I think about it, it's only a, it's a few years ago now. I don't know that, um, well, with this Infinity study coming out that we'll talk about shortly, I don't know that there's been any research published since then that changes my mind on that particularly. Well, it's funny. Like, I probably would do the opposite. I'd just put everyone into a neutral shoe and then give everyone the same advice, as you said, and, and send them on their <laughs> way. Because at the end of the day, like, I, I'm not sure if a lot of medial postings will be will be around maybe three to four years well, from now. This is and, true. Um, this is true, yeah. And, and I'm not sure if that's because the definition of, of, um, of postings is, of support, support is changing or if just we're now starting to realise that, you know, shoes you know shoes are more fun um when they're a bit more compliant and you can go and do whatever you want in them and i guess the reacts and even the infinity almost like casual shoes you can double up on them and so it's almost like uh you know these days the casual shoes are the, are the running shoes from the 1970s anyway so um so maybe people be walking around in the current shoe models um you know in 2050 uh now which we are currently running in so I, I think shoes are probably becoming a bit more simplistic um, to some extent. Uh, but then, of course, the foams are maybe becoming the magics in these sort of foams. And I think that's more associated with performance than it is with, with injury risk, and uh, which makes running footwear really fun. And I think that's where we should be drifting towards footwear and performance and, and sort of stepping back and saying, well, if we keep associating footwear with injury risk, well, maybe we're prioritizing the wrong thing. And that's creating that perception that continues to ongo that um, footwear and injury risk uh, coexist. Um, on a you know a global scale, you know a particular shoe can decrease risk of global running related injury. There's no research on that, as you mentioned. Yeah. And uh, how about how about speculating on this, Michael? You put a runner into any shoe, manage their loads conservatively. They're not going to have a problem. But if you don't manage the loads conservatively, maybe the shoe is going to be or is potentially an issue in that. Whether it's just the drop or the amount of foam. Mm. or not necessarily the, the medial posting or not. And I, I just, you know, if you manage the loads mm. conservatively, conservatively, there's never going to be an issue. Well, that's right. If people don't do as much running, um, their risk of running related injury is much yeah. lower. And, and uh, I, mean, the, I mean, retailers have more tools than what they used to. Like they, you know, stack heights um, and even heel heights and, um, you know, knowing body weight has an influence on potential injury risk. These are a few attributes that you can use to be able to sell shoes in an evidence-based manner as well. And no doubt the best retailers do that. They get the experience of the runner, see what they've had previously. You know, they're not putting people with an Achilles tendinopathy into a, you know, a zero drop shoe, hopefully. And they're not putting people into, um, you know, massive heel raises with patellofemoral pain syndrome. And 
you know, hopefully these things uh, are pretty well well known now. And I think, um, you know, a gate analysis is there just to describe how the rudder runs as opposed to truly prescribe a shoe now. Yeah. But part of this is, we, we, you know, we have the prospective risk factor studies and, and mm-hmm. we can debate any one of those if we like, but we have a set of risk factors that have been identified. Mm. Some of those risk factors are modifiable by, run, modifiable mm. by running shoes. Mm. The problem is, and, and there's a whole multiple examples from other disciplines, when you, you identify these lab-based um, risk factors, mm-hmm. but then when you get out into the field and do the clinical trials, um, the results don't match up. Yeah. Um, and I think we can think of a lot of examples like that. I think in lateral wedging for medial knee OA, with the lab work mm-hmm. says they work, the clinical trials, not you know. Uh, and, and I think that's where part of the problem at the moment is that we, we've got these identifiable and potentially modifiable risk factors. But when mm-hmm. we do modify them, there's not necessarily the outcome that should be expected. No, that's right. It's like um, even trying to control an intervention. Like um, if you're putting people into footwear and you're controlling their... Um uh, their running loads, for example, to make sure that's not one of those variables that influences injury and how hard they're running, etc. I, mean, I know Nielsen's group published a study on compliance and as soon as you put people into an intervention within running, for example, people want to do what they want to do. They want to run with their friends, etc. And suddenly the compliance to the actual running load becomes quite, quite yeah. poor. And unfortunately, in those studies, people tend to not actually report the compliance rate of the intervention. Thus, you know, you can't rule out other factors being a, a risk for increasing the, the, the running injuries. And, and that's why it's a complex system. And that's why, you know, looking at running related injury, people's decision making, their footwear, their running loads, their adaption processes, their, um, you know, equipment seems to be a small piece of the puzzle for running related injury. Yet, I guess still arguably going back to the start of this, um, this podcast is that it seems to be perceived as one that we should be able to influence relatively easy. But as we've just discussed for an hour, it, it, there's 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 no panacea that we've seen to be posted in the literature and yeah it's interesting mm, so, sure. um, how, how's this how's this for a repeat of the napic study by the way based on what we've just said imagine they redid the napic study you know so they've matched for age they're matched for for training and hopefully they're they're mm. getting good nutrition because they were living on the base 16 weeks of basic military training and in, and, and they 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 randomized them into two groups and they indiscriminately give one group a a stability shoe like I would, mm-hmm. and they indiscriminately give the other group a neutral shoe like you would. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they follow them through time and see what injuries are. That would be kind of interesting, right? Because I think the footprint stuff's all well and good, but we know, mm. we know that's gone now. But I wonder, you know, manage the load, you know, or, you know sort of try and manage the load as best you can and just indiscriminately give shoes and compare the, what, what the results are. That to Boy. me would be kind of kind of an interesting study or you have another group and you get them to self-select the other shoe by themselves as well and see if that has a, mm. a factor to it as well yeah. so it's it, it, but i guess other things can influence the risk as well like if someone maybe is a bit more experienced for example when they're running you know, maybe they've got more room to error to, to, to change a shoe for example as well like maybe they've got better tissue load capacity they put on a low profile shoe um, I mean, that's, that's why running shoes can't cause injury. Like a lot of the times, if you change all your dosage and you, you make a large footwear change, well, maybe there's risk attached to that. But I like to think people don't do that where they just change a shoe and change all their load to a, a really dis- discreetly different shoe. And there was the Brun study that I think that was recent, like 2000 and maybe 18 or 19, the Run Safe group again, where they looked at, you know, injury risk and changing a shoe halfway through. And, and found there wasn't a huge difference for people changing their shoes. Maybe the risk increased to a small percentage, um, but they just couldn't exclude all the other potential risk factors. And that's, that's the problem with running injuries. How do you, ex- you know, exclude all the other risks? So, yeah, I mean, injury is by nature complex, multifactorial. Uh, and yet we, we talk about it like we've got a big handle on what causes it in the first place, which we don't. Yeah. And therefore, when it really comes to, you know, how are these, how are these things we put on our feet going to help? You know, we're, yep. we're sort of stabbing, stabbing in the dark a bit, aren't we? Um, yep. Craig, any questions come in? Any no, questions? nothing. I mean, just always, a few always, comments, just... but I, but I just, there was one word that Michael used and that was panacea. So maybe it's a good time to <laughs> move on to the study that inspired the title of this. Um, yeah. We'll talk I'll, about I'll, this. We'll, we'll we just, talk about this guy, shall we? I'll just put up the, 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 the poster that, that Nike put out with, um, the moonshot yeah, so, is a, is a, so, if you leave that up there while I while I yeah. sort of summarise what we 
what we know about this research yet. And of course, quite clearly what we don't know, because this is marketing. Let's make no mistake about that. But it's marketing off of the back of some research that's been done by some very, very um, good researchers. Um, the problem is the research is currently under review for publication mm. and it is not accessible despite um, several of us asking for, for things. So we don't know much. We don't know much. We know what's been released and there's lots of things we don't know. Mm -hmm. Apparently it's going to see the light of day this year, this calendar year, 2020 at some point. But let's, let's, let's talk about this and let's talk about the marketing that, that Nike have made. And I think they've been incredibly clever in their wording. If you look at the wording mm -hmm. Nike have used, and then let's also talk about how that marketing and when that first came out caused just a massive ripple across social media, uh, the blogs, the tweets, and how mm -hmm. Nike was so clever in their wording. They knew that this was what was going to happen. And actually, the way people were reporting this, this marketing was actually, they were misrepresenting it slightly. So let's talk about it. So what, they, what they've done in this study, here's what we know. 226 runners. We know nothing about their uh, running experience. We know nothing about them as, as subjects or individuals. We just know there's 226 of them. We don't even know their sex, sex if we're being honest. Mm -hmm. They are randomized into two groups. One group are given the Infinity React, so the, this, this new shoe. The other group are given the Structure, I think it was the Structure 22. So what mm -hmm. Nike called on their website a motion control shoe. Um, mm -hmm. And what they are then done is uh, sent off for 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, so, so 80, 84 days. We do know that they average 44 runs per subject. So each one of these 226 runners in an 84-day period ran 44 runs. So we can make an assumption mm -hmm. they're running every other day. Mm -hmm. um, which to me probably suggests we're dealing with some kind of level of experience runners here. I don't know that you'd get novices and you'd put them through that, but anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And then they, 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 they decided they were going to monitor what injuries sort of developed. And to speak back to Nitter's original, very well-made point about how is injury defined, um, two things to note in this particular study, that the injury and the pain perception was self-reported, which I think is always interesting um and they defined injury it looks to me like they used the definition that came out of the consensus statement in the jospt so they de defined it as missing three training sessions in a row which yep. if you're running 44 runs in 84 days it means you're probably running every other day if you're mm -hmm. running every other day and you miss three training sessions Seven i'm days. assuming that means you've missed a week yeah yep. absolutely which i think is a uh, probably um, some people may have have issues with it. I think it's a better a better setup than, like you said, Nitta, um, mm. someone missing one day with with Doms, for example. Yep. So we've got two hundred twenty six runners. We don't know their level of experience or their sex. We know that half of them are in the motion control structure twenty two. Yep. Half are in the new new Infinity React. Mm -hmm. They're running. We think every other day, and if they miss three sessions in a row, which probably accounts to a week, that's yep. classed as an injury. What do we know about the injuries? 22% of the entire cohort got injured. So 50 out of mm -hmm. the 226. Uh, so that's 22% injury rate in a 12 week period, which I think is interesting and probably yep. sort of fairly typical, but here's the key. 33 people in the group that wore the structure, uh, motion control shoe were injured and 17 in the affinity react meaning and this is where the, 50, the, the key 52% comes from, 52% fewer injuries mm. in the Infinity React compared to the other group. Um, we'll talk a bit about how Nike is suggesting this, this shoe works in a second, and I'll, I'll hold it up and we'll mm -hmm. talk about its weight, its weight and its drop and things. But let's, let's be clear what Nike have said here. We've run this study. We've run two groups. This group had 52% fewer injuries over a 12-week period, which all things considered is, is factually mm. correct. What fascinates me, and I know you guys saw this too, because mm. we've spoken about it in our little in our little nerdy group that we uh, message on each other on almost daily. Almost daily, by the way. I think my wife thinks I'm having an affair, but I said <laughs> no. I'm just talking just talking to the guys in Australia about shoes. Everyone was talking about Nike saying Nike are claiming that they can reduce running injury by fifty two percent. You know, it's incredibly bold marketing to come out and say we can half running injury with this shoe. And mm. I can't, I cannot find anything, anything 
that's been put out by Nike or the researchers on behalf of Nike that claim that whatsoever. It's how yeah. people mm. have mis misinterpreted that data. Yeah. yeah. Of, of, of course they haven't put anything out like that. And no, I just no. think it's absurd you know, what, we, what we come across online. Yeah. Well, when it first came mm. out, people were saying, this is ridiculous, classic Nike. And there's a lot of Nike haters <laughs> out there, by the way. And all I say <laughs> to Nike haters is, yeah. just put your foot in a vapor fly and you'll become a, a lover immediately. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people that love to hate Nike. And they're saying, this is ridiculous. You can't reduce injury by half. You know, injury is too complex. And injury is complex, but Nike never mm. said they reduced injury by half. They said this shoe in this study, within the confines and the limitations of this study, which we still don't know probably enough about, had 52% fewer injuries between mm. the two groups. So I think it's kind of interesting. And I would assume Nike are, are fairly smart at their marketing. They know what they're doing. They know how to build up a bit of a buzz. It wouldn't surprise me if they knew that that was definitely, they 100% they, they knew that was going to be the response. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and some and, and people all, fell for it. <laughs> absolutely. So let's talk about this guy then. So um, this is a UK size nine. Um, and I've put this on the scales. It comes in at just about two, 245 grams. I've got the numbers here. They, they, they say the shoe can be anywhere. Yeah, it average 250 grams. But obviously, it depends on, on shoe size. So it's, it's a nice light shoe. Um, it's, I've got a pair of the Epic Reacts as well. It, it, it's about similar, to be honest, with regards mm -hmm. to, 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 to weight. Um, it's got a drop of 9 mil. What's the Epic, what's the Epic React drop? I it think can. it still runs up about 10. Yeah. 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 I think it runs so up 10. Again, it doesn't feel too different to me. And I have calves that are quite sensitive to, to, uh, lo to low drops. I'm, 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 a, I'm a mechanical nightmare. So yeah, it's coming in about, it's a nine mil drop. It's about 250 grams. And here are the three things that they say design wise are what make it different. The first is, I'll just hold it up here, what they're calling the rocker geometry. Hmm. which there's no doubt there's no doubt it has that um that said personally when i put this shoe on i didn't massively feel it um yep. you know if you if you've put on a pair of next percents or if you've put on a yep. hocker car carbon this, x this um, is a rocker this is uh this is the yeah, wide ride exactly. that's that's yeah, a rocker yeah yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely has a toe spring here and it has a bit of a rocker. But, you know, when I, I remember when I first put on my Hocker Carbon Xs, when I first put on my Next Percents, just standing in them in the kitchen, I was like, whoa, this, I can mm. feel this rocker. Didn't get that vibe from this, but they are definitely, you know, talking about the rocker as one of their three mm -hmm. big design things. The other one, which you've already touched on, is this wider base that they're talking about. Um, and it is, it is nice and wide in the forefoot. We'll talk about the midfoot in a minute, actually, because um, although it is wide here and, and staying narrow. here, it's very narrow in the midfoot. Um, so yeah. we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and the third, and what is the third one? The rocker base. Oh, you've already talked about the React foam. There's more yeah. of it. I think, I think it's 24% more foam in this shoe than in the... Uh, epic react it's got it's, it. it's pretty yep. so it's it's the it's the same foam there's just more of it so we've got more foam yep. we've got the rocker and we've got the whip and, this and was, they are this saying, was the original one this was the react i think as well so no rocker yeah. attached to this and just a bit lower foam i guess yeah so they look pretty yep. similar but yeah you can see the differences can't you so again they're the three things and and you know i so you, you talk about them like that sort of in a list and you sort of think yeah. what's the big deal but then when we did our Vaporfly episode and we were talking about why is this shoe so far? Why does it feel mm. what, what, did, what did Nike do here? And it was the P-Bax foam and the carbon mm. fiber plate and the stack height. Sometimes these things that in isolation aren't much just all come together mm. and, and something gets nailed, whether it be performance or injury. So perhaps, yep. you know, what Nike, Nike has done for performance in the Vaporfly, the 4%, the next mm -hmm. percent, perhaps the big, big air quotes there, this is what they've done for injury in this shoe. Mm -hmm. um let me talk to you briefly about the mid the midfoot as well because i don't know if you can see this this uh this it's black here and it's gray and it runs all the way around here um it's i, I think they're referring to it as a guide rail mm -hmm. um it's it's rock solid and the first thing i noticed when i put this shoe on is just how much i could feel it in the medial midfoot um like I was really, really aware of it. And if we're going back to the comfort paradigm of, of, you know, a shoe should always be comfortable. And I know you feel like this knitter about Nike. Normally you put a Nike shoe on, but you know, the last five pairs of Nikes I've bought, you know, I put them on and day one, I could do 20K in them. Like if they were like slippers, 
the first time I put this on, my initial thoughts were, I'm not sure if this is comfortable, which is kind of interesting when we're talking mm. about how com comfort has been suggested to feed yeah. into the, the, a shoe that reduces injury. We're all mm. telling people that, that comfort is king. Mm. I've got a lot of shoes. Uh, I didn't find this super comfortable the very first time I ran in it, which I, I, I think was uh, just really interesting. But what I love about the marketing they're doing here, Again, I don't know if it's something you've noticed. They're talking about the rocker, the foam, the geometry, the guide. They're not talking about pronation control. Mm. It, it's, it's, it's not being mentioned. So, mm. um, and in fact, did you see the video that they released, the Moonshot video, really slick yeah. shot one where, um, where one of the head researchers was talking. They actually made reference to the fact that, you know, we, for a long time we tried to control pronation and we, we don't think that's where the answer is. So mm. maybe, you know, we... we we can't change beliefs on a societal level, but Nike probably can, right? Yeah. If they yep. say it, if they say it enough. Um, so what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on, on what the shoe allegedly promises, although also what people think it is promising and what it's actually promising. And what are your thoughts on how all these features come together and, and what you, what you, uh, what you think it might or might not be able to achieve? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like, I, I really enjoyed the React when I first moved into it. And I think if you ran the exact same parallel study and you changed the Infinity to just the, the Flyknit React as well, maybe the outcomes would be relatively similar. I'm not 100% sure because it's it's a perceptual thing. And even some of the – they're using a lot of their uh, their better runners um, who are sponsored by Nike to um, to make statements about the shoe. And uh, the one that stands out to me was uh, was from Bernard Lagat, obviously one of the, the best milers of all time, and he's out to the marathon now talked about the shoe feeling like when you would place it on it felt like you were running a bit more on dirt as opposed to a hard surface and and when you when you place the um the, the tpu foam on it, it feels a bit different to say what the structure trikes would feel like which is a more industrial shoe it's relatively firm and to be completely fair to, to retailers i wouldn't think that many retailers would sell the structure trikes to a large percentage of the population so placing a, a relatively heavy sort of shoe on to people with a, with a posting or stability shoe in this study, uh, different to the Malio study, has seemed to um, cause more injury than another shoe. And um, so suddenly stability shoes are a risk factor now, according to this study, <laughs> for this particular population. So um, so this, this just goes to show how complex it is. But, you know, the rocker the rock has been been apparent in, um, in some of the Nike shoes now. And even some of the other brands are using rockers within their shoe. And, you know, the rocker's interesting. It sort of feels like it does the work for you a bit. Though it's almost like creating the lazy runner. Um, it's doing a bit of work for you, which everyone enjoys on recovery runs and obviously performing. And a lot more midsole. Like I, I, I like a lot more midsole, and I'm not sure if it's because I've been exposed to it a lot more in the past three or four years, and that's influenced my perception. And it probably has. And so I definitely um, search for shoes with a bit more midsole. And the, the Epic React had yeah, probably a bit more midsole than average. And obviously now the the Infinity has even more. So. Of course, I'd probably gravitate towards the shoe and find it a bit more comfortable than a, um, a structure triax and whether that has the risk of injury or whether this is just a great opportunity to be able to compare a shoe that's probably a bit less um, offensive and we start to see less injury risk because the shoe is a bit less, um, it's a bit less offensive. I'm not 100% convinced that a 12-week study uh, prospectively over time can it, it may decrease risk of some types of injuries you know maybe lower leg injuries and foot injuries that you see when you early increase your running but maybe maybe with the the change in geometry of the footwear and the foams maybe if we followed this study up for 52 weeks we might see a different type of injury as we know that when you when you change shoes the loading probably changes a bit when you wear a, um, a really soft shoe I know I think it was a Kulmada study that was 2018 where they had really like high cushion shoes and they compare them to traditional shoes that high cushion shoes would amplify the impact load now and increase leg stiffness. And you think, well, actually that may, and I know those things aren't associated directly with injury, but maybe if you followed them prospectively over 52 weeks, maybe we will start to see different types of injuries um, in these new shoes. Um, and maybe we see more proximal injury rather than distal injury, for example. And, and, and maybe just doing a 12 week prospective study really protects you from, um, from exposing other injuries that may come from wearing a different shoe as well. And you just don't know that, but um, there's always that possibility. So injury won't disappear. Um, it definitely won't, um, it, it won't, won't prevent training errors, but um, maybe we'll see different types of injuries. Maybe that'll be exciting. I mean, we've definitely at our clinic seen a lot more proximal injury, um, wearing a lot more high stack foams and whether that's purely association with the people training for marathons or people, but we definitely see 
people reporting, self-reporting less calf problems and foot problems in a stiffer vapor fly type shoe, which is probably putting podiatrists out of business because they're all getting, you know, proximal injuries and not getting distal <laughs> injuries anymore. So, um, so maybe just the injury loads are going to change. Maybe that's the next step. Yeah, I think it's fair to say we're not going to see injury halved across the world by 52% when this shoe comes out in the next couple of days. Um, but in fairness to Nike, that's that's actually not what they themselves appear to be saying. It's, it's how Definitely. people are, are interpreting it. And I think any shoe that's out there that's trying something different. I was reading um, or, or completed reading just before Christmas, Black Box Thinking by Matthew Syed. I don't know if you've read it. And it's talking about how how much we learn from failure. So the analogy mm -hmm. being the, bl the black box in aeroplanes is, is, mm -hmm. has been the sole reason that the aviation is as safe as it is because every time things don't go well, they learn mm -hmm. from it and they, they go down. We've yep. never been particularly good at doing that in, in, in medicine yep. um, because yep. of the blame culture and things. But there was one particular scenario where they talked about um, the engineering firm, uh, manufacturing firm Unilever. And it was, mm -hmm. I think it was back in, I don't know, back in the fifties maybe, but they were, they were manufacturing uh, laundry detergent and apparently it's massive mm -hmm. million, million dollar business. Um, and they were having a problem with one of their nozzles and it kept clogging up. So they got a load of sort of engineers, mathematicians to sit around the table and say like, like brainstorm, design a nozzle. They sat down and they, they you know, mm -hmm. and eventually they designed a nozzle and it still clogged. So they took a different route and they got a load of biologists in. And what they did was they made 10 nozzles, tested them all in the real, in the real world, in the, in mm -hmm. the machine, picked with the one that was the best, took that, made, made a, a slight adjustment to it, and then mm -hmm. made 10 of those, tested all those 10. Yeah, and basically, essentially made subtle adjustments, made 10 of diff slightly different versions, picked the best mm -hmm. one of the 10, the next 10. And I think there were 45 generations of nozzle. So the 449 failures until they got the nozzle that, didn't clog. And when they looked at the shape of it and showed it back to the engineers, they were like, we could have sat around the table for the rest of our lives and we'd have mm. never designed a nozzle to look like that. And I feel like we can sit around a table and talk about how to reduce injury or mm. influence injury all day long uh, if we want. But are we just, the end, are we making the same mistake that engineers make? Is not having shoes out there in the real world mm. testing it. Yes, it's not going to be perfect, but let's embrace mm. that failure. And let's let all the, 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 the really smart guys kind of make adjustments accordingly. I feel like we're I feel like we're in a good place. Yeah, yeah. You can't argue that um that uh you know, as soon as the I mean the footwear industry, it's interesting that we've just moved to it, you know, injury risk. I mean, Nike spent the last three years promoting their performance shoes and um now everyone's got a performance shoe, we think, well, actually let's get them a training shoe now. So <laughs> um, and so, yeah. so it is quite clever, and of course, the perception of fifty-two percent. People will see the, the you know, the um, the titles of the abstracts and see, well, that's that. I'm going to get Nike now because I'm less risk of getting injured. So, I mean, until you know, until a shoe can accommodate training errors and, and poor decision making, it's going to be difficult to be able to solve the injury risk. But maybe if you're putting a, a large pop, a global population into a particular shoe design, and uh, and it's it's a bit outside what we have thought of originally. You know, there's a there's a there's a chance of reducing percentage of injury risk. For example, with John, a global population, you know, injuries so readily available. Uh, so no, running running so readily available, but you know, injuries are arguably one of the biggest global costs associated um, with 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 sport in general. So so it, it makes sense for a company to try and you know reduce injury risk because it technically will decrease the you know the cost associated with it as well. But unfortunately the cost goes into the footwear. And um, so there's still another cost associated. There's, you're still paying for running. So either way. I think on, cool. on that note, that was a, almost a perfect summary of, of where we're at. We've, we've gone past the hour. Um, so I think we'll, we'll finish there. So look, thanks so much, Michael. It's been, been a pleasure. really Thank good. I think, for me. You know, and thanks for everyone who's been listening and um, thanks Ian. And we will, uh, be back Cheers, next Greg. month. Cheers, Netta. Cheers, Netta. Nah, thanks, guys. It was a pleasure.